Man, today is a great day, and I kind of feel dressed up, to be honest with you. I know I'm only wearing a blazer, but I feel like saying he is risen. He, he is risen indeed. Thank you, one person. I appreciate that. But Merry Christmas. Uh, I'm so excited about getting into the story. It's one of my favorite stories about the Christmas season, and I'll break it down for you guys a little bit. But before I do, I just want to tell you a little story about my kid, because the idea of today's lesson is knowing about God's fulfilled promise. Now, I got to tell you guys, if I could geek out with you for a second, five years ago, I was in seminary, and so I was all about the Greek and the Hebrew and proper theology, and so I, I took my son at the time on my knee, and I'm like, son, do you know what Christmas is all about? And I was hoping that I trained him well, right, to say, Jesus is the reason for the season, Dad, kind of like that, and he was like, presents, and so I'm like, no, you get coal, and so he didn't. I gave him toys, but I started talking to him and I started noticing that I started getting passionate. And I noticed as I'm starting to move my knee and he's sitting on my knee, he's kind of like, well, what are you doing, dad? Kind of like that. I'm like, son, in Genesis chapter three, humanity fell, but then God made a promise. But then also, if you look at Revelation, you know that Jesus is a lamb that was slain before time. And then son, did you know on Christmas day, the promise was fulfilled? Get off my lap. Like Jesus is the reason for the season. Like Jesus is the fulfilled promise of God. And he's like, can I go to mama now? Yes, go. <laughs> but the idea I want to keep in your head today is that Jesus is the promise fulfilled by God, that God is not only the promise maker, but God is the promise keeper and the quicker picker upper, right? I just had to add that in there for some, that was for free. Okay. But as you guys open up your Bibles to Luke chapter two, what I wanna do is I wanna kinda of paint the picture in a more realistic, grungier kind of view because you've probably seen the manger before, right? Can we just show a picture of that manger? Look at that manger, look how beautiful that is, right? You've probably seen that on front lawns and the, the stores and all that. And just, just, just admire it for a second, can't we? Like first you have the wise men. So this isn't biblically accurate, okay, Bible nerds? Because the wise men didn't show up for two more years, but whatever, okay. But then you look at the star and look how, look how pretty it is. It looks like a cross, you know, foreshadowing Jesus, whatever, okay. And then you look at the animals and look how well behaved they are and how clean they are, right? Oh, and then you, you look at Mary and look, look how serene Mary is. This woman just gave birth hours ago, right? Like, I don't know about you ladies, my wife was not happy, even if she had an epidural, right? She's like, get away from me. <laughs> She's not here, I could say that. So like, and then Joseph, Joseph's looking nice, but look at the shepherds though. The shepherds look so nice and so clean and so happy and so reverent, right? But I wanna paint this picture that's more realistic because I think that the shepherds best relate to you and to me. And here's the reason why. If you look at the last book in the Old Testament, it's called Malachi, I'm sorry, Malachi, right? And the next book after that in the New Testament is Matthew. Now there's 400 years that take place between Malachi and Matthew. What's the big deal? Great question, I'll answer. Okay, so basically there are no angels for 400 years. There's no parting of the Red Sea for 400 years. There is no movement of God for 400 years. It is just complete silence. And then we come to the shepherds. Now, shepherds weren't, it wasn't a glorified position. You didn't want to be a shepherd because to be a shepherd was to be the bottom rung of the social ladder. You were untrusted. You were unworthy. You were scum. How much? You were so scummy, right, that you could not be a witness in a trial. In fact, if you were a lady back in those days and you see a shepherd, you'd get your purse, you go, ooh, icky, right? But look at this, kids, look at this. Question, what do sheep do? Sheep do what sheep do, and sheep do, right? And these shepherds were around these doing sheep all the time, amongst the sheep. So these guys smelled bad, they looked bad, and their reputation was bad. It wasn't clean. So let's get to Luke chapter two. And we're gonna start in verse eight. Who else is excited? Am I the only one? Okay, here we go. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, in the NIV, it says that the shepherds were living out in the fields. 
These shepherds were living out in the fields. What does that mean? Great question. Okay, what it means is this, is that these shepherds ate amongst the sheep. They did life amongst the sheep. These guys were comfortable amongst the sheep. They found identity amongst the sheep in the dirtiness, and in the bad reputation. They found comfort in being rejected and alone. Do you see this? But then as we pick up our story, what time of day is it? At night, great job, sir, back there. It was at night. What does that mean? Well, back in that day, check this out, millennials, right? They didn't have iPhones back then, right? They didn't have any flashlights back then. They had tiki torches, right? They, you, if you want to find somewhere, you have a little fire and you only see probably two feet ahead of you. But what these shepherds wanted to do is they wanted to be so far away from community because they didn't want their sheep to be stolen. And so they're gonna be as far away as possible so no one steals the sheep. So they're grimy, they're dirty, and they're isolated, and they're alone. Are you there with me, church? And it's a nice starry night. Let's get to the one before that. It's a nice starry night. And now you have Bob the shepherd. Now let me tell you about Bob the shepherd. I'm making him up just for fun right here, right? But can you imagine, it's nighttime. The sheep are banging. Any kids here? Kids, what do sheep sound like? That was pretty bad. That was pretty bad. <laughs> Kids, one more time. What do sheep sound like? Okay. Bah. What's up? <laughs> Put a dab on that. Bah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, they're mine, right? And, and Bob the shepherd gets up. He's like, oh, man, my back is all messed up. It was a long day of shepherding. Uh, and then you get to verse 9, and it says this. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. What's the big deal? Well, in the Greek language, this is written in the aorist tense. Okay, $10 word, okay. What I'm saying here is boom. Like this angel didn't pop out a mile away going, boom, where are you? Boom, where are you? Boom, where are you? Like this angel came out of nowhere. Bob the angel just trying to go to the restroom real quick and boom, like, have you ever been so afraid in the middle of the night that you actually make up a word, right? You're like, kind of like that. Just, Am I speaking in tongues? Oh my gosh. Right? <laughs> That's how afraid he was. His heart was seized. Like, what is going on? Because remember, it's nighttime. And not only is it dark, but all of a sudden it is bright. And an angel appears to him. And what does this angel say? He says in verse nine, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. Of course they're filled with great fear. But look at this real quick. Did you notice in our story so far that when these angels went to go look for the shepherds, it wasn't like a spotlight, like, where are you shepherds? I need to find you, right? It, it wasn't like that. God knew exactly where to send the angels. What does that mean about you and me? Is that God knows exactly where you're at. Even in the darkest of places, even in the dirtiest of places, the most shameful of places, God knows exactly where you're at. But also this, if you read the book of Isaiah, Jesus is given different titles. You remember? Jesus is known as the wonderful counselor, almighty father, prince of peace. But what else is he known as? Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. So what does that mean in this whole entire story is that not only does God know where you're at, but God desires to be where you're at. God desires to be where the shepherds were because he had a message for them. Shepherds, I am with you no matter what. So anyways, look at this, <laughs> this angel says in verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not, Basically, he means, stop it, Bob the, the shepherd. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, I, I lost some of you. Look at this, okay? This shepherd, bottom of the rung of the ladder of, of society, right? This guy was smelling bad, looking bad, all that. And this angel says, for unto you, Born this day, the Messiah, the promised one. Oh, I, I, you guys still don't get it. Okay, let me tell you a story. Ready for this? Okay, back when I was a young dad, right, just several years ago, uh, I, I, would, I, I found out I was going to have another son. 
And so my mama, this is what my mama said. She said, son, make sure you buy two of the same toys. I said, mom, why would I do that? I'm gonna teach my kids how to share. Thank you, parents. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? I'm gonna teach my kids how to share. I am going to be logical to a one-year-old mom where other parents have failed. I will not fail. I will be logical where my kid will say, thank you for the correction, Father. I appreciate that. I will listen to you with no tears and no tantrums. So anyways, years go by and, and what, what happens? My kids fight over the toys. My kids are not logical for some reason. They even fight over the same box that the toy came in. Like, I wanna play with that now. Ah. And I can hear my mom laughing in the back. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> so then the following year, I give in and I buy two of the same toys. Let's just say it's a, a Buzz Lightyear. And so now I have two toys that are exactly the same. And guess what my kids do? They fight over the same toy once again, but that's mine. And oh my gosh, ugh, and I'm praying to Jesus, trust me, right? And so finally, I came up with a brilliant idea. I said, you know what? I'm gonna put my kid's name on the bottom of the toy. Ha ha, brilliant, right? So if my kid starts fighting, like, oh, I want that. Let's see who it belongs to. Let's see the name. Now back to our story. Whose name was on the name tag of Christ in that manger? For the angel said, for unto you this day is born the Messiah. When you see this right here in the gift of Jesus in the, in the manger, whose name on, is on it? Your name is on it. The gift of peace, the gift of love, the gift of identity, the gift of salvation, that the gift of Jesus has your name on it. For today, unto you, this day, the Lord is born. Can you see the face of Bob the shepherd? <gasps> like, angels, then this gift, what? Like, this is a long day already. But then, oh, we continue on in our story. And he says in verse 12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So this angel would tell the shepherd, I'm gonna send you on a holy scavenger hunt. And here are your clues. You're gonna find a baby in swaddling clothes in a manger. Let me tell you how crazy that is, okay? It's like today. You're gonna find a baby in a diaper in a hospital. Good luck. <laughs> I would wish that that angel that came out of nowhere would just spiritually uber me into that hospital, Right? But what caught the attention of the shepherds was that they had to go to a manger. And a manger was used as a feeding trough or a drinking trough for animals. So like, that's kind of weird, but we're game. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. And so verse 13, and suddenly, boom, like right away, like these shepherds didn't go, okay, thank you, angel. Hey guys, bust out your day planners real quick, okay? Does Tuesday work for you? No, next week? Okay, yeah. How about next Thursday, yeah? No, they're like, no, like we need to talk about this right now. And so, and suddenly, verse 13, there was an angel and a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Oh, poor Bob the shepherd, freaking out, already having a heart attack with one angel, but now you have a multitude of angels. Once again, 400 years of silence. And now they're able to be in attendance of the first heavenly concert, praising God and worshiping him. In verse 15, and the angels went away into heaven and the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem right now and see this thing that happened which the Lord had made known. And look at verse 16. And they went with haste. Boom. Like, we gotta go right now. In some translations, it means that they ran. Like, if these guys wore traditional garb, like those long gowns, right? You know, let's pick it up. Ah, kind of like they had to run real quick. And they're running to the highways and the byways. They're jumping over fences. They're going in people's backyards like, do you see a baby? Do you see a manger? And they're running over rocks. And I can imagine being one of those Israelites, like, oh, there's a shepherd. Get off my property. If they had guns back then, but they didn't. So anyways, so like these guys are still no good. These guys are still shepherds. 
They didn't have time to clean up. They didn't have time to take a shower. They didn't have time to get robes that didn't smell like sheep do. They went immediately. They obeyed immediately. Before we move on, isn't it interesting how some of us try to get cleaned up first before we go talk to God? How some of us try to clean up our vocabulary. We try to clean up our activity. We try to clean up our behavior or whatever. And we play a game with God in a sense of like, I can't pray to you yet. I can't go to church yet. I can't do all this because of how dirty and wretched I am. Can't we take a lesson from the shepherds and take a step in obedience and saying, hey, it's God that cleans you up. It's not you. Because behold, today is a day of salvation. You're imperfect. You have scars. You have all this. You are dirty from the head to the toe. And God says, today is a day of salvation. Come to me. So these shepherds run. <laughs> these shepherds run. And they, they go with haste. Now, we don't know how long it took the shepherds to find baby Jesus. It could have taken 10 minutes. It could have taken an hour. It could have taken three hours. Can you imagine Bob the angel, oh, the, the shepherd going, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Oh my gosh. And then they get right here to the next verse. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now, in case I lost you, let me paint the picture for you. These shepherds are running, jumping, looking, trying not to be creepy, but looking in people's backyards, right? And they're going, they're going. And finally, here comes Bob the shepherd and he finds sweet little baby Jesus and he's out of breath going, as I found him. Bob was a smoker. And so like, he's like, I found him. Oh my gosh. And so even though they found him, now they start saying, guys, you're not gonna believe what happened today. These angels, they came, they scared me, but they said that this is the Christ. And, and like, he starts sharing with everyone in that room. And then the multitude of angels, it was, we had to do something. Who else was in the room? It was Joseph. And Joseph was like, bro, bro, he was a surfer. Bro, you have no idea. Like I had a dream of an angel, right? And other people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And here Mary is she's just taking it all, all in. And looking at the psyche of Mary, like this was a young girl that risked her life to have the Messiah. And I bet she probably struggled with doubt. She struggled with fear. She was human, just like you and me. But to hear the testimony of the shepherds, I wonder if she's like, it's true. It's real. Everything's gonna be okay. And I kind of wonder about Mary as she pondered and she looked at this and she remembered this, that she would remember this as Jesus was hanging on the cross some 30 years later. It's gonna be okay. Jesus is who he says he is. I remember when the shepherds came and testified. Like, I remember. It, was, it meant so much to Mary. Now, if you notice, in, in verses 17 through 19 that we've read so far, you won't read a boom. Meaning the shepherds didn't come and go, oh my gosh, we heard about the baby. Okay, bye. Like that, that, that awkward. There was no sense of immediacy in chapter, sorry, verses 17 through 19. So what does that mean? These shepherds could have taken their time. They could have taken 10 minutes, an hour, or even two hours. If I could use some creative license for a second. Go for it, preacher. I will come down. All right. Join me here in the nativity. You are a shepherd. You are on the bottom of the rung of the social ladder. You are in a dead end job that you can't put shepherd on a resume and someone's like, oh, wow, shepherd, that's great. I need you on my team. No, you are rejected. You are not trusted. You are scum. Don't even look at me in the eye. And you are treated like this all your life. You're probably in the family business where you guys are used to being treated like this. You're not allowed to go into synagogue because of the stench, but also because of your responsibility to the job. And so you look at those religious people and they just judge you and they look down on you. And so you build this bitterness and this anger and this resentment, not only towards God, but also towards man. Like, God, where are you? 
400 years of silence. You're not moving in my life. You're not moving in my family's life, not even in our nation. But then one night, this crazy night where angels come and visit you, and you're like, fine, I'll take a step of obedience. Fine, I'll go. And so you go and you're experiencing this opportunity that you never thought you would ever have. And you find this baby here that is the fulfillment of the promise that God had made so long ago. He could have shown up in the temple. He should have shown up in front of Herod. He could have shown up in front of the high priest. But for some reason, God is fulfilling his promise in such a lowly state of the manger. And you get to witness it. You get to be the audience of this. You get to hear the baby coo, cough, or breathe. What would be going through your mind? Like, I don't know about you, but like, if I could see Mary, I'd be like, Mary, um, I, I had to run like two miles, and I don't normally do that every day. Like, I don't believe in exercise. I believe in extra fries. But like, can I just hang out just for a second? Or what about this? Like, Mary, like, I know that this is a private matter and all that. Like, can I just, can I just hang in this corner? I just, please. And as I do that, once again, I would, for me, I would think, like, God, I'm unworthy of this. I know, right? <laughs> but I kind of wonder, though, if there's one person, maybe even in this room, if you would have the audacity to look at Mary and say, Mary, can I hold him? What if she said yes? That you would get up just like this and you'd approach with caution and you still have your stench and your face is all dirty, your nails are not did, and you come up. I don't know why I'm being super careful with the fake baby, but <laughs> you pick up this baby and you treat him gently as you would a sheep. What would go through your mind. For me, if I had the audacity to ask this, I'd be like, I am unworthy to hold you to breathe the same air that you have. I'm unworthy for you to come onto earth. I'm unworthy for the sacrifice that you're gonna make on my behalf. I'm unworthy of your grace. I'm unworthy of your love. I'm unworthy of this opportunity. I'm unworthy of this relationship. And yet here I am, God. Would that go through your mind too? And you take your time. And finally, you put the baby back. And what you just experienced wasn't a transaction. What you just experienced was transformation because you were just in the presence of God, experiencing the grace of God that you get to Luke 2, 20. Look at this verse right here. It says this, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and all that they had been told by then. These guys right here would have to go back to the sheep. They would have to go back to the sheep pen. They'd have to go back to the stench but yet they didn't go back the same the way they came in. They went transformed, glorifying God and praising God for all that they had seen and all that they had done. And church, look at this. You too will leave those doors in just a couple minutes and you're gonna go back to your sheep pen. You're gonna go back to your family that is struggling. You're gonna go back to the bills that are piling. You're gonna go back to an area where you feel like you just filled with sadness and depression. You're gonna go back to your life right there where you're even struggling with your marriage, but you don't have to go back the way you came in. You can leave these doors glorifying and praising God that he is Emmanuel, that he just doesn't know where you're at. He wants to be with you. He wants to be with you in that broken marriage, with you in your sadness and depression, with you in your struggles of faith, with you in your financial burden, with you in every aspect of your life. You are not alone. And church, even though this has a tag with your name on it, my question is this, will you take that gift today? Will you take the gift of freedom? Take that gift of grace. 
take that gift of forgiveness and love and mercy? Or will you leave it? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for tonight that we can focus on you and be reminded of the promise that you kept. And Father, if there be anybody in here, Lord, hearing my voice today, Lord, that has not received the gift of salvation, Father, I pray that today can be the day of salvation. And if that's you, I'm asking to pray with me and say this, dear Jesus, I admit I am a sinner and I believe that Jesus is the son of God who took upon my sin on his shoulders and died on the cross for me. Will you be my Lord, my savior, and my friend? Father, for anyone that's prayed that for the first time, I thank you so much, Lord, that they can receive this free gift from God himself. And I ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide them every single day, Lord, to live a life, Lord, where you are at the center of it, where you are the foundation. And for anybody in here as well, Lord, that already has a relationship with you, Father, I pray that you will renew our passion, renew our love, and renew our focus pointed towards you. We thank you so much for your love and the gift of salvation and for you keeping your word. So Father, as you hear these carols sung by us, Lord, would we be reminded of your faithfulness and would you inhabit our praises? In Jesus' name, amen.